Please accept my humble obeisances of Raja Chair Prabhupada. Prabhu, we'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Usha Rupnarayan, who does the official welcome. And introduction, Hare Krishna Mataji, thank you so much for joining us. Hare Krishna. I I'm deeply honored. And I'm also very humble to be able to participate in this meeting uh, this afternoon. And um, and His Grace, I wanted to steer away from the normal welcome because we all know that you in your heart, you're from Durban and now you're being in Mayapur. Um, you know, I, I, I had, I actually believe it's an honor and a deep privilege to chat with you this week. And um, you, you empowered me with so much of transcendental knowledge. It's, it's, I cannot begin to fathom or actually, I, I cannot even contextualize it because when I spoke to you and um, it was almost like at that crossroads, the dilemma I was facing and you were able to speak You were able to show me the path, almost like a mentor. And today we, we're very blessed. We're always blessed to have you because I keep telling Paramatma Dasa, whenever I have the privilege of being, you know, on the same platform of you, I can't even compare the two of us because your knowledge is right up there and mine is down here. But, you know, what, what, you, what you give out, I, I can't even begin to tell you know, the devotees of the depth of the knowledge. And I, I'm deeply honored because it's of a deeper level and it's not of the superficial level. And um, we may have degrees, we may have skills, but it cannot, it cannot comparison to the knowledge that you bestow on us. So I'm so humbled and, and I deeply appreciate what, what you say, your words. It's almost like nectar, even when you speak, the beauty, the flow, the melody, the, the positive, I, I can call it vibes, if, if you may, it just flows. It shows you your love for Krishna. It shows the depth, the nectar of knowledge. So I wanted, I know um, with all apologies to Prabhu, he gave me a bio of you and I wanted to deviate from that bio because I, I think in knowing you, in speaking to you, it's that depth, it's that connection that comes through. And, and this is what we are blessed with. It's that positiveness. And even when you speak, the smile that comes on, on your, onto your face, I, I think it's so infectious. All of us cannot, not but actually smile. And, and you, you know, we are so humbled. We are so honored to have you in our midst, in our presence. And uh, I, I don't know if your parents are joining us uh, this evening, but I, I want to say that I, I, I just wanted to steer away from the norm and I just wanted to uh, relinquish in your presence and say thank you so very much that you can, I'm really listening, to, looking forward to listening to you tonight because when we talk about the mind, the mind is so complex. The mind is this repository of knowledge, of memories, and sometimes to detach, it's so difficult. And um, I, I look forward to, to what you're gonna empower us with, what you're gonna enlighten us with, and the knowledge we're gonna take forward. So I, I'm deeply humbled and uh, I look forward to whatever you're going to imbue us with. Thank you so much, His Grace. Uh, Ratham Krishna Das. Om Ajnana Timirandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasme Sri Guru Venamaha. I was born in the darkest of ignorance, but my spiritual master opened my eyes with the torchlight of knowledge. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances at his lotus feet. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvise Shashunyavadi Pasyatya Desatarine Vancha Kalpa Trubhyascha Kripa Sindhu Vyevacha 
पतितनाम पावने भ्यो वैष्णवे भ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधार शिवासादि गौर भक्त वृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्ण हरे कृष्ण 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो थैंक यू उषा जी फॉर दैट क्वाइट एम्बेरसिंग फॉर माई सेल्फ टू हियर दोज ग्लोरिफिकेशन बट इट्स एक्चुअली द ब्लेसिंग ऑफ शील प्राउपाट एंड माई स्पिरिचुअल मास्टर दैट वी कैन शेयर सम नॉलेज to help another soul uh on the journey back to the spiritual world so i'm very very grateful to you for that coming coming from an esteemed person like yourself a doctorate and a, a politician uh somebody who served the community uh i'm very honored to hear that uh from you and the glory is the message of bhagavad gita and the glory is to shila prabhupad for giving us this message so thank you to all the listeners as well all the viewers who have come on and joined us today for this class uh the vedic perspective of understanding the mind and uh trying to uh make a, a better assessment of ourselves by doing so mm, the yogi's perspective so we've just come from the month of kartik a beautiful month of meditation of festivals of lights of auspiciousness lots of all the wonderful things that make up spirituality and positive energy uh all of that in one month that's quite a lot <laughs> so we've just come from that and in our topic for today we're trying to assess uh what is this feature called the mind uh you know western psychology just encapsulates it into one concept calling it the mind which comes under the study of psychology but vedic knowledge breaks the mind up into many components in essence it breaks it up into 16 components uh memory uh uh thinking uh understanding uh identity identifying so many different aspects of the mind we're not going to get into all of that because we want to have a practical a pragmatic approach today and that is where the bhagavad gita has started if you see the bhagavad gita and the narrative of it we see that this warrior arjuna uh if you read from the beginning of the gita and you read to the end of the gita what has changed nothing has changed physically nothing has changed but one thing has changed arjuna's mind by the message of of bhagavad gita we are sure to have a change of mind and a change of mind is a change of heart so what had happened to arjuna because he was directly confiding in krishna saying i'm confused hmm I don't karpanya dosha prahata swabhava prichanti tvam dharma samuda cheta yakshreya nishtita bruhitan me shishaste mam shadi mam tvam praparnam Krishna I am confused what should I do as dharma what is my dharma in this position so confused is also a good place to be because it shows you are not just content with memory which is one of the components of the mind as we've discussed that your previous assessment and assimilation of life is based on memory and when you in a confused state you are assessing but you also open to higher levels of consciousness or higher levels of knowledge and this is a very important place to find ourselves because by nature of education and by nature of learning now they call students learners right so by nature of education and learning we are being fed a program and what is that program 
in Vedic understanding, it's called Sudra program, a worker. You are being designed or in euphemism, you're being brainwashed uh, to think in a certain way, to respond in a certain way, to act in a certain way, and to work, to use your abilities in a certain way. So in and itself, it's not wrong, but if it, if it doesn't allow the flower to blossom and release that fragrance, then it is being restricted from that. That is what Vedas try to teach us. And this is the understanding of the mind that I'd like to start with. That in understanding the mind, we got to appreciate that it is a holistic component. What is it? It's a holistic component. It's made up of different features, but it acts as one. This is the principle of uh, unity in diversity. That as much as there are diversity, there's 16 different levels and more, but at least 16 components of the mind that Vedas tell us about. But when they work, they work holistically. And that is a very first level of assessment of the mind, understand that it is working from so many different dimensions in a psychological way. So because psychology is what gives us our identity, you remember we are personalities, we have a body, but we also have a personality. So the physical body is connected by the five senses to the mind. Those are called Gyanindriyas. And then the body works in a particular way, those using those senses, and those are called Karmindriyas. But those components are stored in a feature called, for uh, jargon's sake, the mind, so we can relate to it. But Vedas give us very def definite and concise appreciations of this phenomena called the mind. So the senses are all connected, five powerful senses, all connected to the mind. All that information is coming in 24 hours. So, and then from memory, there's another feature of the mind where it uses memory to uh, assess what will be the most efficient form of memory that is rising to the surface that you can use to make your current situation better. So it's always accepting and rejecting. You know this about the feature of the mind that it will accept one thing and then it will give another thing and tomorrow it will accept the same thing it rejected. So it's not, it's simply proposing. That's the correct word to understand that the mind is simply proposing what would be good? It's not saying you must do this because we haven't been trained to understand the mind. As soon as the memory feature comes up, how does the memory feature come up? It's the stimulus from the environment. It sees something and it connects it to memory because the senses are connected to memory. What you see is you can only see and identify something if you remember it. If it's not in your memory bank, you'd say, hey, I, I don't know what this is. It looks like, then you compare it. But in looking at it on its own, you can't feature because it doesn't have a memory base for you. So what the brain, what the mind does, it, it makes all these memories come up. And when you understand this, then one part of regulation is seeing that these are just memories that are coming up. Why am I acting on it? I can see it for what it is and not for more than what it is. When I overreact, it's directly an expression of the mind. So when one sees like that, the first thing that Vedas tell us is remove yourself a little back. Move a little back. If you, if you connect with it directly, you're not able to understand the different components because you are caught up in it. Because remember, one feature of the mind is identity. And we have an identity, we have an ego. So if you don't remove that a little back, you're not going to be able to see and you're not going to be able to assess. So we'll come to that when we're discussing the uh, uh, things that we can do to help improve the mindset. Hmm?
<laughs> the mind is because it's very susceptible to so many things. We think, no, it's only the environment and then also the, the memory. The moon is another thing that is very closely connected to the mind. That's where we get the word lunatic. <laughs> First, you get the word lunar. Then you get the word lunatic. What does that mean? That means the cycles of the moon affects the mind. The moon, like we say, when the mind is enchanted, when it's uh, in a romantic mood, then best is moonlight, right? You don't be romantic in the sunlight, right? <laughs> it's moonlight that charms the mind. Hmm? So the mind is susceptible and influenced uh, because the brain is predominantly made up of water. So when the, when the moon pulls the tides, you know, when there's full moon, the tide gets bigger. So it also has an effect on the water in the brain. Therefore, it affects the mind. So Vedas are very scientific about this. So on one level, it's been influenced by nature and the moon. On the other level, it's influenced by the environment. And on another level, it's influenced by memory. So because all the memory that we have is not pure, 99% of it is impure, means it's not purified. Therefore, when it comes up as a suggestion, maybe you should try this. And you say, yes, <laughs> because you don't have an, a deeper understanding of it. So usually when we use the word mind control, that we have to control the mind, why, why do we have to control it? Have you ever asked yourself that question? If something is working well and in a very efficient way, why does it need control? The problem is it's not in your control. Control means it's working in a very efficient way and it's a very powerful tool, but it's not in your control. You're not holding the steering wheel. You only got the accelerator down but you're not holding the steering wheel. Now, what's going to happen with that is inevitable, right? <laughs> so what the Vedic perspective tells us, understand the different features of the mind. And when you understand it by moving yourself a little bit back, then you can assess. Nobody can assess from an involved uh, situation. You have to pause, move yourself a little back. And when you move yourself back, then you can assess, see the different components, see what is happening, see how it is reacting. And then you can make a better judgment. And it's at the, the, the deepest level of the mind is when it's, when it's connected emotionally, emotional reaction, because that is so powerful, even the intelligence can't even reason at that level. And we will take a very nice example of that. When two people are in love, can, is it reasonable why they behave that way? Why they do that? Why they say that? Why they are always trying to talk and all, all those things put together? <laughs> it's not logical. So logic is not the only component of the mind. When emotions are stirred up, when hormones are stirred up, all these factors now are bombarding the mind at one time. And now you understand why you're having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> so Vedic knowledge tells us there, there's different components that it's made of. Krishna mentions this in Gita in the seventh chapter. Bhumi ahamkar itimanye bhinnam prakriti ashtata. So he's saying there are five gross elements, bhumi, apo, nalo, vayu, kam. There are five gross elements, and then there's a subtle body. The subtle body is made up of these elements, earth, um, mind, intelligence, and false ego. Now there's a component also that is the most subtle form of gross matter, and that is ether. Earth, water, fire, air, ether the fifth one. And that is another component that we don't consider that affects the mind. So we discuss the outside senses, we discuss the memory, we discuss emotions, we discuss uh, uh, on at least those three, then now we're saying there's a fourth effect 
due to modern technology, Ethernet, where electromagnetic waves are being sent through the ether and your Wi-Fi is connected all around and on a subtle level that also affects or contaminates the mind. So can you understand now why the mind is so restless? Why you can't sleep at night? Because it's all these factors that are coming in all at one time and we're not giving the mind an alternative. What is the alternative? The alternative is spirituality. It's non-material. If there's something that is non-material, because mind is subtle matter, it's affected by everything material. Where does it get its rest? Where's the component? Where's the aspect of the mind to get rest? We know we may be sleeping, but we still dream, which means the mind is still working at that level. So where can the mind get some kind of rest? It can only con get some kind of rest if it's connected to something non-material. That means spiritual. And that's why it's very uh, uh, nature is it's uh, very comfortable with the idea of meditation because meditation bridges the gap between all these material traumas that hit the mind at one time. And then meditation gives it an alternative to say, cut out everything material. Let's just focus on something non-material. So it makes sense then that meditation would help to bring down the trauma of the mind. That's why when, you, when you're in a meditative state, you feel relaxed, you feel happy, you feel joyful, you feel your, your, the nature of who you are actually comes out as a human being. A fully evolved conscious human being can express these emotions. But somebody whose mind is bombarded by all these other factors and doesn't know the technology of how to transcend that situation is somebody who like Arjuna in the beginning of Bhagavad Gita. Because he didn't know, he knew all the scripture, he knew the 20 Dharma Shastras, he knew all these things, but he didn't know how to make the connection to transcend it. And when Krishna taught him Bhagavad Gita, it completely made sense to him of how to do it. So the nature of the mind we know in the fifth chapter, fifth canto of uh, Bhagavatam, Rishabdev speaks about the nature of the mind and he describes it like a wild animal. He says, it's like a wild animal. You can't trust it. It may be tied, it may look tame, but any moment it can change its nature and pounce on you, even attack you. So this is the impure mind. Why is it impure? Because it's only connected with matter and matter by itself is jada, it's dead. And anything that's dead is impure. Just like somebody, you may love them, but when they die, you won't even go near their body after two or three days because it's impure. So because the mind is only connected to matter all the time, material things, material concepts, material emotions, matter, 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 matter. Now you're wondering what's the matter? <laughs> this is the matter. So we have to give it an alternative. Otherwise, it doesn't have any recourse for rest. And this is why spirituality is so important. So once we understand that by its nature, it's associating with matter, it's becoming more and more impure, how to make it pure, how to purify the mind. You must remember, this is such a serious component of sadhana that even a sannyasi takes bath three times a day just to purify the subtle energy of his body. Just to make sure that because energy traps in the body, on your subtle body, there's a deep science behind this, how subtle energy affects one very deeply. We know when Hanuman was going to Sri Lanka, then that demon, Sarasra, caught Hanuman's shadow. And by the shadow, which is a subtle form of the gross body, it's, it's a gross thing, but it's subtle. We can see it. We can't see the mind. So she knew how to catch the shadow and she pulled him down. So two things you can learn from this. 
One, be careful when you're standing in front of somebody and talking that that person is not standing on your shadow because if they know the art, they can easily manipulate you very easily. So be careful teaching you something. <laughs> Don't let anybody stand on your shadow. We know this with Tulsi, right? We say, don't walk on Tulsi Maharani's shadow. So shadow is a, it's, it's maybe subtle. You may not be able to hold it, but it's still an aspect of who you are. And it follows you every step you take. So if somebody knows how to connect to that, they can cause some harm to you. So this is subtle energy when one has to know the subtle side. We know the gross, we studied everything outside. We don't know enough about the inside. And this is what uh, the Vedic perspective tells us, it teaches us. And Prabhupada was asked once, they were doing a morning walk and uh, the devotees were telling Prabhupada that Prabhupada, you know, people are uh, commenting that, you know, uh, we don't do anything else. We just, uh, you know, what else do you do about life? You know, you only this Hare Krishna thing. Uh, aren't you missing out on life? Aren't you missing out on the different aspects of life uh, that you are? You're just dedicating your life to, to God like this. Aren't you missing out? So Prabhupada stopped, put his cane down. He looked at the devotee and said, yes, you are missing out. And then the devotee said, excuse me, Prabhupada. He says, you're missing out on suffering. <laughs> we are missing out on suffering because pain is there for everyone. But suffering is a choice. Suffering is a choice. You can choose to suffer due to lack of knowledge. You don't know better. Therefore, you becoming susceptible to the dictates of the mind. So be careful of that. Hmm? Uh, in uh, Patanjali is the famous yoga sutras that come, 196 yoga sutras that are given in four chapters, padas. And the second, in the first pada called Samadhi pada, Samadhi pada, Sadhana pada, second one, uh, Vibhuti pada, third one, and fourth one, uh, one more is there. So th that first pada, Samadhi pada, is describing uh, how yoga is performed. And it's described in that the second sutra, hmm? yoga, hmm? yoga, uh, yoga vritti nirodaha. Hmm? So it's describing how that one must come to understand the mind. Hmm? Yoga chitti vritti nirodaha. Yoga chitta. Hmm? To understand the chitta, which is one component of the mind. Viroda, vritti nirodaha, that one has to come to terms in some form of yoga to control the mind. So I want to, in Gita, Krishna describes many things about the mind. The one chapter is dedicated in the sixth chapter. But Arjuna at the end of that is saying something very profound. That as much as you're describing the mind and how to meditate on the tip of the nose and all these things and how the mind is like a candle Mm, and that it must be unwavering, the flame. Remember, all these uh, examples are material. The flame of a candle is even material. The unwavering nature of the wind, wind is a material phenomena. None of those components are spiritual in themselves. This is why the best expression to understand the mind comes from bhakti yoga. So we're going to cover this, these three aspects. What is the mind understood as in karma yoga, which is first six chapters of Gita? What is the mind understood and how to work with it in bhakti yoga, second six? And what is the mind in the third six, jnana yoga? So if we see the karma yoga section, one has to do yajna. Hmm? Yajna na karma no netra, lokayam karma bandhana, yadatam karma kaunteya, mukta sangam samachara. That one has to do karma as yajna. But if one doesn't do then then lokayam karma bandhana, you become bound by your actions. So one then learns that if I'm engaging my mind in karma, I should not be bound. I should not be engaged in activity that is binding me. So what is the activity that doesn't bind one? It's pious activity, op opposite of being bound, 
vikarma is being free, uh, which is called karma. So if you do karma and offer it as yagya, then you get punya, you get blessings from that. But Krishna himself also cheats in this because at the end, he describes 1866. Don't worry, I'll give you moksha and masuchaha, don't fear. And aham tvam sarva paap. I'll take away all your sinful reaction. Now, karma is not only sin, it's also punya, good action. So if Krishna is aham tvam sarva paap, I'm taking away all your sin. What's going to happen to my good reactions? <laughs> What's going to happen to that? Who's going to take that? Because if somebody doesn't take that, I have to take another birth to finish that. So even Krishna bewilders us by that. That's why the real uh, uh, jewel of the Gita is in the middle, not at the end. Nasta moha smiti labdhya. My moha, my illusion is cleared, uh, uh, Krishna. I have no more illusion. So one of the components we'll go over is illusion. How to know when you're being illusioned or not? How to know when you're being distracted or not? So we can see karma works, but it has one defect, it, that it doesn't get rid of your pious activity. And that's why Krishna says, Aham tvam sarva papebhyo. Pap is sin only, not your punya. So who will take my punya? Well, you're trapped with it. You can't get out of it. You become so uh, pious that you'll go up to heavenly planet. And from heavenly planet, a brahma bhuvana loka puna varjino arjuna. That from that high level, our Brahma, from Brahma's planet, you'll come back down here. So you'll get more punya and go up and come back down. It's like a merry-go-round, a giant wheel in the fair. So how to break that? So karma can't do it. Let's look at jnana. How does jnana deal with the mind? It says reject the mind. This is That's why that sixth chapter of Gita is explaining how a jnani or an astanga yogi deals with the mind. Firstly, you have to be completely celibate. Kali Yuga, I don't know where you're going to find somebody like that on the street. <laughs> so it's not going to be practical for everyone. You have to be celibate to do this. Secondly, you're rejecting the nature of the mind. You're saying stop. The mind must stop. The mind must stop. This is Buddhism where it says, stop the nature of the mind, of thinking, of uh, desiring, of acting, all these things, because it becomes binding. So it's true in one sense. Yes, desiring, if it's impure, will become binding. But is there a way to connect desire and not be bound? Ah, that is bhakti. That is bhakti. Hmm? Only bhakti can do that. Nirbandha Krishna Sambande Yukta Vairagya Uchyate. It is also vairagya, renunciation, but it's nirbandha. It's bound to Krishna sambande. It's bound to Krishna. Therefore, we can see karma and the mind doesn't work because you get trapped by your punya, good qualities, good quality, uh, uh, karma. And jnan doesn't work because you're rejecting. Now, the only reason you reject is because you're taking an absolute stance that you understand the whole of nature. That's why, and by rejecting, you are saying God has created something invaluable. That is, that is impudent. You're not saying, I don't understand how it's meant to be used. You saying, I reject it means it's invaluable. It's binding to me. I don't want it. I reject it. 90, 90, 90, 90. It's not this, not this, not this. So it's a sign of impudence. The real approach is with humility, that I don't know how it's connected with God. Can anybody teach me that? And when you get to that component of the mind, then you can understand how really things are meant to be. That's why I started the talk by saying, if you see the mind, instead of 16 different features of the mind, if you see it holistically, that the, body, that the body, mind, and soul work holistically. And this is where spirituality is going today, which is a good sign. Yoga is moving to holistic kind of living, 
because by the nature of the mind, it segments everything. It breaks it into components. By the nature of intelligence, it dissects everything. So you got a dissected, uh, uh, you got a dissected vision of reality. And in your conditioned state, you're thinking that's the real reality. Full reality is meant to be dissected like this. No, real reality, which yoga is teaching, is meant to be holistic. Everything is inclusive. Therefore, you have within diversity, you have unity. Therefore, when we see that, you know, I may have be brown color, my, my friends may be black color, they may be green color, they may be yellow color, red color, blue color. So there is diversity, but on the level of the soul, there is unity. That's the only platform where there's no way at all that there is uh, any form of separateness. We are all connected as spirit soul under Aham Bija Prajapita, Krishna as a Supreme Father. So I want to uh, go over uh, Paramatma Prabhu. Can you put these those that list up? So Bhakti, while Prabhu is putting that list up, Bhakti seems to be the most uh, pragmatic approach towards understanding the mind. Because Krishna is saying there, man mana, seven chapter, beginning of seven chapter, Prabhupada spoke most classes on this verse, 7.1. Maya shakta mana partha yoga myunjan mat ashraya asham shaya shama grama yata gasna sitakshanu. He says, takshanu, hear from me, Arjun, how maya shakta mana partha, how you can get your mind attached to me. Because once you learn the art of getting the mind attached to Krishna, that's the source of all of creation. Am bija prajapita. I am the bij. I am the seed of all uh, humanity. So once you have the fatherhood of God, then you can have the brotherhood of man. Because we can relate, connect, and serve together as real brotherhood on the spiritual platform. On every other platform, there's diversity. But if we can't appreciate diversity because we're connecting to the mind, when we got a problem, the mind just focuses only on that. It's not allowing you to see the problem in a diverse way. It's only telling you, you are a victim. You are a victim. You've become a victim in this whole thing. And it's only showing you all those aspects of life. Where is the holistic view of life? It's not giving you a chance that way. So unless you understand the components and the nature of the mind, you're not going to relate to what is bhakti. Mm? The word bhakti comes from the word bhaj. Bhaj means to love mm? or worship. So, uh, and puja is meant for demigods. So when we do bhaj, it's connected with bhakti. And when we do puja, it's connected with demigods. So the, the defining feature of uh, bhakti is that Prabhupada describes in Srimad Bhagavatam that the by reading and studying Srimad Bhagavatam the subtle body will become dissolved. Your subtle body will become dissolved. That means the feature of the mind will, hack, will, will not be working separate. That component of separateness is gone. You are just working on the physical and on the spiritual level. There's no intermediate uh, subtle level. Mm? So therefore, you don't have the repercussions or the trauma that comes with um, an, a disturbed mind or a mind that doesn't have stability. Why? Because it doesn't know how to connect to the spiritual platform. That's called yoga. So we got the list up, Prabhu. Okay. So I'm going to uh, go over this. It's a 10-point list. It's just something I put together so we can have some direction in ass uh, assessing the mind. So the, the scriptures tell us that the first thing to do is regulate. First thing, regulate the mind. Why to regulate? Because when the mind is idle, it becomes the devil's workshop. By regulation, it already knows what it's going to do. So the subtleties of energy that it's being bombarded with is not prominent, it's not strong. 
because regulation is stronger. And you know, I have to do this. I got this, I got this, I got that. This time, that time, that time. So regulation is very important. By practice, practice means regulation. Second, one of the features of regulation is that you can assess the mind for uh, when it has a difficulty, you can see it for a starting point and an ending point, a cycle that yes, I'm going through a bad cycle now, but just like I had a good cycle before, it will also come. And then another bad cycle will come. And then another good cycle will come. So when you start seeing the, the features of the mind and, then, and the reactions of it as cycles, you don't get emotionally worked up. You don't get emotionally connected with the problem. You see it for what it is, not for more than what it is. See it as a cycle. It has a starting point. It will finish at some point, no matter when it will finish. So by regulation, you can uh, easily work with the aspects of your mind. Secondly, diet. What are you feeding your mind, both mentally and what are you feeding your body? If you're not feeding your mind proper positive energy, like Usha Ji was saying at the beginning, that we need positive energy. We need that vibration that is positive. What you're feeding your mind is what you'll get out of your mind. If you're feeding your mind anxiety, trauma, that is the same thing it's going to give you back. How to, how to uh, if you got a different recipe, how do you expect this to come out on the side? So you need to know what you're feeding your mind. And you need to be aware of what you're eating because food is very susceptible to subtle energy. You know, you're from Durban, I don't have to tell you <laughs> how people put it for you there. Huh? We know that. We have to be careful of that, right? Why? Because they, 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 they connect it to the subtle nature of food and by uh, taking that, it will affect you. So diet, what you're feeding your mind and what you're feeding your body. Number three, illusion. Understand the illusionary nature of reality. It's very important to be real with yourself. Hmm? That everything you know about life, you've learned from pe different people. And it's done by pratyaksha, direct sense perception. Could it be that the senses are not giving the full gamut of reality? Yes, because it only works with light. Eyes only work with light. Ears only work with sound. So there's limitations within that. So therefore we pray, Om Ajnana Timirandasya, Jnanan Jana Shalakaya, that I'm born in ignorance, but my spiritual master is teaching me what is illusion and what is real. That's the greatest thing a guru can do for you. A guru can bless you. All those things are secondary. He can even joke with you, laugh with you, all of that. But if he doesn't dispel your ignorance, if he's not able to show you what is illusion and what is real, then he's not a guru. This is a very important point to understand. Okay, number four, neglect. That when the mind is, mothers know this well, that when children seem to be very traumatic, they just ignore them. And slowly children get the message and they adapt accordingly. So how to neglect? We got to learn if we don't uh, practice neglect. Hmm? This is nectar of instruction. First verse. Vacho vegam, manasakroda vegam. Hmm? These are the urges that come from the mind. And urge means it's just the stimulus. It's this coming up from somewhere. So first understand uh, that if you're going to tolerate something, you have to understand why you tolerating and a very good reason to tolerate is if you if you know that this is lifetime by practicing bhakti it's your last lifetime you should have taken 10000 lifetimes to come to this point by the mercy of Srila Prabhupada, you came to this point in this one lifetime so what is the difficulty in tolerating one insult two insults 10 insults each thing you tolerate, in each insult you tolerate is one life that you would have taken as a full human birth. But now all of that is reduced. 
all of that is gone. You don't even see that. So for that kind of a gift to tolerate a little bit insult, to tolerate a little bit hot and cold, to tolerate matrasparsa to kaunteya, sidoshna, sukadukada, agama, payano, anitya, stams, tatiksva, bharata. Oh, son of Bharata, if you're going to be tatiksava, balanced, equipoised, you're going to have to control your mind for hot and cold outside and happiness, duk and suk inside. If you're going to be pulled by those, you're not going to be tatiksava. And if you're not tatiksava, balanced, equipoised, tolerant, then how will, you able, how will you be able to control your mind? So if your mind is restless, understand you haven't given it enough incentive to be tolerant. So you need to gain more knowledge. Why should I be tolerant? I'm tolerant of one person, one incident, one insult, I'm, the more I'm tolerant of that, I can only be tolerant if I'm remembering that one lifetime is gone just by tolerating this insult. One lifetime is gone just by tolerating this person. One lifetime is gone just by tolerating this event. Isn't it worth? Hmm? Isn't it worth that this thing tolerating will take a few days, a few months, maybe even a few years, but one lifetime I don't have to take anymore. What a return gift. Unless you think that way, how will you be able to control your mind? So you engage it. Hmm? So number five, meditation. So meditation, I was saying, is a very beautiful component of the mind. But if we, in bhakti, how do we use meditation? By thinking of service. How can I expand the service to help all those unfortunate people? I'm not trying to indoctrinate, I'm trying to share. If they accept it, very well and good. If they don't, okay, they're not ready for it, no problem, but at least let them be theistic. Let them be praying in some way to God, connecting to God in some way. Maybe they're not ready for bhakti on this high level, but at least they can start with connecting and worshiping God. So how to use my mind in that way? Because the mind, if it's not used that way, it will become the devil's workshop. So I use my imagination for preaching projects and for expanding the mission. Number six, remembering Krishna. If I'm not remembering Krishna, then I'm being distracted. So this is very important thing that the, the easiest, the, the biggest thing that I see today in our devotee community is distraction. Mm? And distraction will cause destruction. <laughs> Be careful, because if you see what's going on on the media, on Facebook, you know, the wars that are going on there, it, it, nothing compared to what happened in Kurukshetra. You must know, first verse of Gita is saying, Dharma Kshetra Kurukshetra, that this place is the place of Dharma, Kurukshetra. Therefore, whoever is right or wrong, there doesn't matter. They are on holy land. You are arguing and fighting on Facebook. Is that a Dharma Kshetra? Is that a place to have fights and feuds with uh, other devotees based on what you have understood? I don't say right or wrong, but I say see where you are fighting. You see where you are arguing. Is that a place of Dharma? Facebook. So please consider carefully. And that will distract you so much, it will distract you. You will become distracted by that. And how is it possible to remember Krishna then? Not possible. So be careful of distraction. Number seven, attach the mind to Krishna. That if you're not remembering Krishna, how is it possible to attach the mind to Krishna? Not possible. Therefore, Prabhupada was advising on the morning walks. You see the ocean. This is Krishna's creation. You see the land. You see the sky. You see the nature first and how this nature is God's nature. It's his creation. Some aspect of God is within this. Some aspect of his divinity. This is just a spark of my splendor, Arjun. So when you first see that, then you can see Krishna. Otherwise, if you just look at Krishna only, you're not going to be able to relate and connect, again, separate, again, not holistic. You're not seeing the whole picture. Number eight, engagement. 
make sure you have proper service because if the mind is not engaged, it can recreate havoc. So make sure you have proper engagement. Number nine, Sangha, association with like-minded people. There used to be a saying in the old days, tell me your friends, I'll tell you your character. So it's so perceptive that what you're seeing as friendship, you are becoming associated with. So if you want to have the, the proper consciousness, then you need to uh, connect with people who are in proper consciousness. And the last one, prayer. Bhaktivinoda Thakur describes that one should chant. One kanti means four rounds unceasingly. There is no excuse why one can take the bead mala and the bead bag and not chant four rounds continuously. It takes half an hour. What is so distracting unless there's something really, really urgent that you have to stop chanting in a continuum for four rounds? At least four rounds. Bhaktivinoda Thakur calls us one kanti. So prayer is the vital force. That's where the mercy comes from. That's where the pleading comes from. That please, Krishna, without your help, uh, although bhakti is being described, Krishna is saying, man mana, bhava mad bhakto. First think of me, then bhava mad bhakto, then become my devotee. We first becoming devotees, then we thinking of Krishna. <laughs> Prabhuji, you can remove this now. Thank you. So we first, we first thinking of, we, Krishna says, man mana, bhava mad bhakto, first think of me, man mana. So if we're not getting that down as a practice, then how will the mind be favorable to what you want to do for Krishna after that? So don't become a devotee first, become familiar with your mind first and see how it's working, learn how it's working, see the different components of it and see man mana first think of me bhava mad bhakto then you become my devotee madhya ji mam namaskaro then you offer namaskar to me by doing that and what what else madhya ji mam namaskaro mam evasyasi satyam de pratijana priyosi when god is saying satyam de he's saying i'm saying this to you as the truth arjun it's very, it's a, it's a declaration, it's a disclaimer. So it's a very, very powerful message that Krishna is saying. And twice he repeated that verse in the Bhagavad Gita. So if Gita only has 700 slokas, Krishna spoke 575 slokas, he's repeating this verse. Don't you think it's important? So what is the importance? First think of me, man mana. Then become my devotee, bhava mad bhakto. Don't do the reverse. First think of Krishna. And we've discussed some points today on how to do that. This is such an elaborate topic. I just touched on some components of it to give you something practical, pragmatic that you can apply in everyday life and find some peace. This is what the jnani wants. He wants peace. He wants peace of mind, peace of heart. But Peace is only relevant if you're staying some Middle Eastern country <laughs> at the moment. That's when it will be very relevant to you. What if I offered you bliss? What if I offered you ananda, bliss? Then would you want peace? You only want peace because for you right now, the mind is so distracted. But if I offered you bliss, if I may blissed out, if your mind is blissed out, what will be the relevance of peace in such a state of consciousness? Samadhi. What will be the relevance of peace in Samadhi? You only want peace because of disturbance. If there's no more disturbance, will you still want peace? <laughs> You'll want ananda. That is, comes from relationship. That comes from connection with Krishna. That comes from bhakti yoga. So I'd like to stop there. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, is there any questions anybody has or Paramatma Prabhu? Paramatma Prabhu, are you there?
I'm not hearing you. Maybe your mic is muted. Oh, Usha ji, are you there? Yes, Grace, I'm here and okay. I've listened and, um, you know, it's like an empty cup. I've taken in everything and the 10 <laughs> points. And I, I believe you were so right in when you gave that analogy of the wild animal, because that's how our mind is. The disturbia, the distractions, the delusions, the dilemmas. And it's almost like we have to capture control the mind and that's where all of our problems are and you were right the solution is ananda how do we seek this and you gave us the solutions so i think you know i, I don't want to dilute the lecture because you put it so beautifully you've captured mm -hmm. the essence of it those 10 points and i think you said the mind is almost it is holistic. You have to look at it in its entirety. You can't break off its pieces because when you look at the mind, it's emotions, it's the thought processes. And what we as human beings, as much as we are human, we are full of all our flaws, our sins, our vices. We have to begin to detach. And I think that is our journey. And you've given us very good spiritual transcendental knowledge on how to do that, on how to deviate and how to detach and attach and focus. Uh, I think it's so important because in this world that we live in, everybody, it's so easy to do yoga. It's so easy to talk about mindfulness. The term mindfulness, it's become almost like a jargon, but essentially it's about mind control. And when we as humans, become controllers of the mind we, we we don't become reactive beings we pause we sit back and that's your message his grace and i'm i'm deeply deeply humbled I, I'm, I'm so thankful because in almost a simplistic form because the mind is so huge it took psychologists like freud and carl jung and all of them philosophers to almost dissect and break down the mind. You can't do it in one lecture, but you've given us important pointers. You've given us something to look forward. What we need to do in our daily lives, we need to detach our, our diets, the illusion. And, and uh, I'm grateful for that. I think um, Paramatma Das has some questions yeah. uh, that he would like to address, but from my side, I am- Thank you. Really I just would like to comment on one thing that, uh, you know, it's we speak of the mind being uncontrolled, but if it was working well as we would want it, would you want to control it then? <laughs> so the problem is not the problem is not that the mind is uncontrolled. The problem is we have no understanding of it. If you understand how it works and the different components of it, you'll know how to connect it. And that's called yoga. How to connect means yoga. So that's what bhakti is saying. Karma is saying you work with it, but we I mentioned the defect that you got left with your piety and piety cannot be nullified. You have to take another birth for that. And then Gyan is saying reject. And I'm saying if you reject, that means you're taking an absolute stance and you understand how, uh, how it is irrelevant and God has made a mistake by creating it. But bhakti is holistic. It says, no, don't reject anything. Use it in the service of God. Use your talents. Use your abilities. Use your creativity. Use nature. Use everything to glorify God. And it's such a simple point, but it's so powerful when you put it holistically together. And that's what bhakti is doing. It's putting it holistically and saying, don't reject, don't separate, don't negate. Use it all in glorification of God. Because if God made it, surely he's the most intelligent being. It has some value. It has some merit. And if I can't understand it, doesn't mean he, did, he made a mistake. It means my understanding is incomplete. So thank you for that point. I, I really appreciate your 
summary on that. And uh, yeah, any questions, Paramatma Prabhu? Hare Krishna Prabhu, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. Sorry, there were some computer issues. Yes, Murphy's Law. So, Prabhu, there's a question. Um, <laughs> um, there's actually yes. five questions. Oh, okay. Let's, uh, how we did on time though, I think, did we cross over time? Okay. So what is the most effective means to control the mind? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's answer them in a, in a brief synopsis. So scripture talks about mantra, hmm? mantra, man, mantra, iti trayate, that the e most effective way to control the mind in the age of Kali Yuga is using mantra which is sound vibration. So that is the most effective way. And in the Kali Santurana Upanishad, it, it explains which mantra, because there's so many mantras. So it describes there, iti sodas kam nam nam kali kalmasana nashanam natta paratananya upaya sarva veda sadrasyate. So he says these 16 names of the Maha Mantra that we chant, the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, that these, there are 16 names. So iti so das kam nam nam. These 16 names, kali kalmasana nashanam. All the kalmash, um, the dirty effects of Kali Yuga. Kali kalmasana nashanam will be completely vanquished by this mantra. And what else? Natta paratananyo upaya. I, Brahma is speaking to Narad and he said, I cannot recommend anything higher. Sarva Veda Sadrishyate in all the Vedas. So this is Brahma's Natta Paratananyopaya. You can't get any mantra higher than this in all uh, Sarva Veda Sadrishyate in all the Vedas. Dristi means to see. Sarva Veda in all the Vedas. I can't see anything higher than this in the age of Kali for in all the Vedas. This is Brahma who has each head is speaking one Veda. He has all the Vedas and is completely absorbed. And he's giving his verdict. So synopsis again, mantra is the secret for controlling the mind in Kali Yuga, in that meditative state. Remember I said, move little back and come to your, connect to your spiritual nature. Once you connect to your spiritual nature, you can assess matter after that. You can't... Human being is one part of matter. You can't just feel human and, and go with the emotions of human and, and try to resolve your problem. you got to pull yourself back to the level of the soul and then see. See your human nature. See your subtle nature. See material nature. And then try to assist. Then it will become very easy to understand. Next question. How to tolerate agitation in the mind? How to tolerate agitation in the mind by yeah. seeing that that's the same point I was making about tolerance by seeing that I'm not going to take another birth. If I continue on this sadhana, on this path, then I won't need to take another birth. Isn't that worth it to tolerate this small event? Can take one whole birth right from womb, right till school, right till everything, till children, right till granny, till old age, old man. All of that is all one lifetime gone just by tolerating the small incident. Isn't that a good bargain? All right, next question. How to make a mind, the mind a friend of ours? Yes. Atmanam, Atma Bandhu. Krishna says in Gita, the mind can be your best friend. Atmanam, Atma Bandhu. It can be your friend. It can also be your worst enemy. So one way is to connect it when things that abilities God has given you. First, see what abilities. Shabdake, hmm? Shabdake Purusham Nishu. Krishna says, I'm the ability in man. Rasoham apsa konteya prabhasmi sasasuriha pranava sarva vedeshu shabdake Purusham Nishu. I'm the ability in man. So what abilities God has given you? See that because automatically that's your proclivity. That's the way you are designed. That's the way you are made. That's your, your biology. So if you take that and use it to glorify God, that'll be the easiest way. That'll be the first step and the easiest step because you already resonate with that. Next question. 
how to detect when the mind is falling down? Oh, <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah, so Krishna describes in Gita 2.6263. Jayato vishayan punsa sangaste subajayate, sanga sanjayate kama, kama kroda vijayate, kroda bhavati samoha, samoha smriti smriti brahma, smriti brahma syad buddhina, so buddhina sat pranasati. So he describes in those two verses, eight steps, how the mind falls down. But first it starts with dhyato, contemplation. While contemplating dhyato, while contemplating the, 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 the material desire, one develops attachment. That is where you have to catch it. So contemplation is not wrong, but when you contemplating the material desire, knowingly it's gonna lead you in the wrong way, that is where you have to try to. That means then you haven't given the mind enough engagement. Therefore, it's bringing up all the past desires. It's bringing up all the past problems. It's bringing up all the past emotions. Those things are there and they'll only go away if you have higher engagement. Param drishtam nivartate. Until you have the higher taste. Vishaya vinivartante nirharascham dehinam. Param... Uh, Krishna describes until you develop a higher taste for life. This is about life. We're not talking religion and Gita and Shastra. We're talking life. Until you have a zeal for life, you're not going to transcend your current situation. Until you have something more to look forward to, to work towards, to become until you develop a higher taste of life. And if you keep seeing yourself only as a human being and not as the spirit soul, remember we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. It's only one facet of life. One species on this planet is a human being. And why is it that the whole world caves in when we can't, contain what is happening to us because we are identifying so much with this body. So that's why Usha Ji also mentioned some, some level of detachment is required. So how to detach? By attach. That's the process of bhakti. You detach by attaching to Krishna. So I'll end on this point. Prabhupada describes that Krishna consciousness is a cultural presentation for the re-spiritualization of humanity at large. It's a culture. It's made up of dress. It's made up of cooking. It's made up of dance. It's made up of music. It's made up of art. It's made up of uh, scholarship. It's made up of logic, nyaya. It's made up of so many components. Put all this together, it's a culture. And put this culture connected to God, it's bhakti, devotional service. So it's as simple as that but it's also as difficult as that. So once you see the connection, once you see the yoga, once you see the thread, then it's very easy to align your life without giving up anything, connecting everything on the spiritual platform. So thank you very much. I'm very grateful to you all for joining us today. I hope you learned something. Uh, please, whatever you've learned, imbibe it and share it with others. There are a lot of people out there who are suffering but like Prabhupada said, the only thing that devotees don't do is suffer. <laughs> we go through pain, but we don't go through suffering. Suffering is a choice. Srila Prabhupada ki jai. Gaura Bhakta ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, thank you so much. Pancha Kapa Tirubhyaksha. Kripa Sundu Vevacha. Hare Krishna. Arante Koti Vaishnava Rindaki Jai. Prabhupada Ki Jai.